inflation, financial stability, monetary, issue, monetary greening, these either get your heart really pumping or you don't really know what they exactly mean. We are here to explore them together with uh, Dr. Olaf Sleipe. He has been part of the uh, Dutch Central Bank since 1993 and has been executive director of the Dutch Central Bank on monetary affairs and financial stability since last year. Dr. Sleipe, thank you for joining us or actually welcoming us at the DMB. My pleasure. Uh, first question, monetary policy is very complex, very, uh, apparently there's multiple central banks, it's also very important. Why, in a nutshell, why is it so important? Yeah, it, it is, it, it's a good question because we talk a lot about monetary policy, it's our, our daily bread and butter, but maybe sometimes it's also good to ask yourself again the question, why are we doing this? Um, it starts with uh, obviously the objective monetary policy. What 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 do you what do you want to aim for uh, when you pursue any kind of monetary policy, basically? And uh, in let's say since the you can say since the 1980s, since 1990s, there is a general uh, understanding that um, central banks should be responsible for price stability. Uh, it's much more nuanced than this, but should be uh, responsible for price stability. That in doing that, central banks should become or should be independent. Um, and indeed, the aim of monetary policy is to maintain price stability, however you want to define it. And there are a lot of differences still between jurisdictions um, in their mandate and how things are defined. but. In the end, it boils down to this. So, so we um, pursue monetary policy or we make monetary policy uh, to uh, achieve our, let's say, ultimate goal of the central bank, which is price stability. What does that mean for the average Joe? Why should average Joe care about monetary policy? Um, he or she should carry, should, 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 should be, I wouldn't say concerned, but um, uh, I mean, normally, when things are okay in an economy, people don't care that much about prices. They don't care that much about inflation. You can also say that a definition of price stability is when consumers and investors do not care about changes in prices. But if people start to get worried about, oh, but things are getting really expensive, it's going to affect my purchasing power, uh, I need to do something in terms of wages, uh, but also the other way around. Uh, I mean, uh, price increases are, large price increases are, um, uh, are not good, but also uh, price decreases might be actually detrimental. Because when that happens, what ultimately, uh, what ultimately happens is that, yeah, an economy starts to function less and less and less and might even start to dysfunction. And of course, the, the big example, or the, 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 the typical example that is often quoted in this respect uh, are, the, uh, are the experiences in, uh, in Germany uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the 1920s when inflation was, uh, was soaring, was so high that actually uh, the price of a bread could change from one day to the other. Um, this is uh, the classical example, uh, but, but I think it's still true uh, that if you uh, if people start to worry, if investors, if consumers, if companies start to worry about price, price changes, whether they're positive or negative, uh, when they're really starting to impede on the, let's say, economic process, then you have a situation which can be defined as not price stability. And yeah, and it is the aim of the central banks to kind of prevent that from happening. Yeah. Uh, you became the executive director here at the DNB, the central bank, right before COVID hit. Yes, yes, uh, one, about one and a half years ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a turbulent time. Yes. What was the biggest challenge you were facing then? Now, I think at that point in time, uh, now I'm talking about, uh, when was it, March uh, 2020, um, nobody really knew how financial markets would react. And I think everybody had still a little bit in mind what happened uh, uh, shortly after the the, 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 the financial crisis hit, uh, basically Lehman Brothers, mm -hmm. and that financial markets completely dried up, and and uh, uh, and although of course the pandemic, which is an which is an external shock, uh, is completely different from the financial crisis. I think this that, that I think was our first reaction, 
uh, can the financial system still function normally? Uh, and it proved actually that, of course, we had to help here and there as central banking and regulatory community, but it proved actually rather resilient. Uh, maybe also because of the lessons that were drawn uh, after the financial crisis. So that was, the, that was our first priority. And of course, then maybe a couple of weeks into, uh, into the lockdown, the first lockdown, yeah, we also started to think about what, what, will, what, what is this going to mean for the economy, for economic development, for economic growth. And then I think we turned our attention more to these kind of questions. Okay. There is a, a hot debate right now on inflation, right? What is it going to do? And we'd like to explore this topic a bit. Um, so what do you think how, how inflation will evolve? Yeah, we, we see uh, inflation, um, and now I'm talking about inflation in the Netherlands, but it's true also for inflation in the euro area. Um, we see inflation going up. We expect inflation to go up, in particular this year, uh, due to a number of circumstances. First of all, first of all the, the increase in oil prices. Uh, we saw a huge drop in oil prices in 2020 due to the pandemic, and we now see oil prices increasing anymore. So that's bas uh, uh, basically a base effect, you can say. Mm -hmm. We also see that there are some hiccups in, let's say, uh, um, the, 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 the production, certain production chains and that producer prices are going up. Um, having said that, uh, the relationship between producer prices and consumption prices empirically is not that strong. So it doesn't mean that uh, uh, increases in produce, producer prices immediately lead to an increase in consumer prices. But over prices. the longer term, they would, right? Could be, could be. Um, at this, point, at this point in time, I mean, there might be an effect, but it will be temporary. So what we do think is that inflation goes up um, uh, this year, uh, might also actually uh, hit the, the, the 2% or even be higher than that. It's now 1.9 estimate, right? Yeah, and uh, but it might actually be, be even above that. Uh, I mean, predicting inflation rates at such a short notice is almost as difficult as predicting exchange rates. Um, but then we expect it to go down again because we, we do expect that these are temporary factors. Um, so the temporary and, factors, just to clarify, are like production prices going yes, up? Yes, and the oil prices is, is in this, in this, in this, in the, the oil price increase or the energy price increase is temporary because uh, at a certain point, the increase that we see now from a low level to a high level, at a certain point, uh, when, when the months gradually progress, that kind of falls out of the figures mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. again. But inflation falls back on like uh, pr what the what pre uh, pre the COVID crisis was normal level, so it was already below the two percent. Yeah, I wouldn't call it necessarily normal. The new uh, normal, indeed. Or the... I don't know, but it was indeed uh, below two percent. We do expect with the with growth picking up huh, uh, this year, but also next year and the year the year uh, after that, two thousand twenty three. We do expect inflation to gradually increase again. Uh, but indeed, uh, according to uh, uh, the forecasts uh, that we have at this point in time, it will not, um, it will not uh, at least on this horizon, it will not go above 2%. Uh, I think the key factor here, because uh, that could be your next question, why is this so? But the key factor here, of course, is the uh, situation in the labor market. And uh, you were already referring to produ producer prices becoming really a risk for, for the economy. Uh, I mean, if prices increase a lot, and this would lead to higher wage claims. Uh, so mm. if, 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 if you see labor costs going up, yeah, then I think uh, one should be a little bit more worried because then it might become a more structural thing. Having said that, we don't see that now at this point in time at all. Uh, actually, nowhere in Europe, uh, the labor markets are still, in a way, uh, in a, in a COVID mood, so to speak. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, uh, unemployment went up. The Netherlands, to some extent, is an exception. Uh, uh, our employment rate went up, but only marginally. And and uh, according to our own projections, it will hit, let's say, somewhere between four four and a half percent next year, and then it will go down again. 
I mean, even without a pandemic, a lot of countries would be extremely jealous, jealous on such an yeah. trade. Yeah. Speaking of that, in the Netherlands, uh, you're also part of the governing council of the European Central Bank, and they use their tools to put uh, aim for the two percent margin, two uh, percent inflation rate uh, of the harmonized index of like all the countries. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the metrics between countries are different, and also inflation rates are different. Yeah. Would you expect after the COVID crisis, the Netherlands would diverge even more with the inflation rate compared to the harmonized index? Um, I don't. I don't think there is a direct relationship between, let's say, what happened now after during the pandemic the and shortly after. on the ar- labor markets. Different it's it's different. It's different. But at a certain, you're right about that. Huh? Um, and we see, we do in, indeed see some divergence. Huh? You see that. Uh, uh, a country uh, like the Netherlands, but there are also other countries that are re- recovering relatively fast. Um, there, there are certain reasons for that. Other countries are hit more by by the uh, pandemic and may not be re- may not recover as fast uh, as the Dutch economy. So I'm, uh, it's adding, to, you could say, to to already existing divergence within the EU area. But here again, uh, I would say that it's not a lasting thing. Plus. Uh, we have now the introduction of one very important tool to kind of uh, alleviate those divergences. And that, that of course, is the EU Next Generation Fund, uh, which is, uh, we're talking about a lot of money uh, uh, for for member states, um, partially loans, but also partially community uh, uh, expenditures, where, of course, uh, uh, the countries that I hit more, most are getting more funds than other countries, and, I, I, and there should be a stabilizing effect uh, from from uh, from that. Because in uh, during the financial crisis, um, countries were also hit differently. Um, that impacted the the initial starting position of the financial states of those economies before the pandemic hit. Right, so the initial financial yes. position was very different. Yeah. Also, the composition of s- sectors uh, within countries is different, so that also led to divergence. Right. And now you're saying that the next gen fund will stabilize that again. Hopefully, it will make a contribution. I'm not okay. saying it will it will solve all the problems, but it will. It's definitely uh, an, an important and big contribution. And uh, uh, the policy mix after this crisis of during this crisis was different from the policy mix after the, the financial crisis. Mm-hmm. A monetary policy is uh, uh, accommodating. That was also true after the financial crisis. Fiscal policy is accommodating as well. And that was not the case after yes. the financial crisis. And that is a huge difference. Yeah. And um, uh, from our point of view, especially given the, the, the very low interest rate environment in which we are, huh, and actually you reach a point where it becomes very, very difficult to do more on the monetary side, and we call that the effective lower bound of interest rates, mm-hmm. then uh, under these circumstances, and there, there's also uh, a lot of research in this area, uh, then uh, yeah, fiscal policy is more effective. Uh, doesn't mean that we always feel uh, uh, that, that this is, under all circumstances, the uh, appropriate policy makes, obviously. Uh, so. Um, some people say, uh, sometimes I hear some people say at the Dutch uh, Central Bank, they have lost their uh, their beliefs in the sense that they're now preaching for, uh, fiscal, for, policy, uh, yeah. for fiscal policy, a very relaxed fiscal policy. Uh, this, that is very much state dependent on what we are seeing here. Yeah? And uh, it's also very much true for the Netherlands, where we have a very good starting position, as mm. what you were referring to. In terms of low low uh, public debt, um, other countries for other countries who have a much higher public debt ratio, this is much more complicated. Uh, but there might be difficult, uh, definitely circumstances where we would uh, spread another message, so to so to speak. Where where's what causes change um, in in the idea that we shouldn't really do austerity measures and we should just like spend essentially. <laughs> I think it it, it, it it is born in the nature of this crisis. Uh, uh, the, this crisis? The, the, the pandemic. Okay. Uh, the pandemic is, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a crisis that um, uh, uh, that comes from outside. It's not, fr- it's not coming from within the economy. Um, and then it's both an external 
uh, you can say, a supply and demand shock. Um, and under these circumstances, um, uh, basically, you can see the government as an insurance company. Uh, so, so a country is hit by, uh, 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 by a crisis, a uh, health crisis. You can also think about flooding or whatever, you know, a, a, a natural disaster, let's call it that way. Um, then um, uh, the government uh, really acts as the insurer for a country, for the society, and steps in. And that's what the Dutch government typically did, other governments as well. And I think that's also the appropriate policy reaction. There's not much else you can do, actually. Thereby, you cushion, in a way, uh, the blow uh, the pandemic has or has had to the economy. And I think in the Netherlands, we clearly saw that because mm -hmm. we, uh, when we were making our, our forecasts for the, for the Dutch economy, uh, uh, the last couple of months, we, we, we mainly have been um, uh, let's say, erring on the negative side. You know, the grow growth rates were, uh, or realization of growth rates were much, uh, in the end, were, were much higher, were much more benign than we had expected. And fiscal policy uh, has played an important role in this, yes. Yeah, so the Dutch uh, economy recovered pretty quickly. Uh, other countries in the EU as well, but not all of them. And we've seen this before as well, right? Economic development in, in several countries yeah. within the European Monetary Union is different. Um, and this also relates to the, well, clash of camps within the governing council, right? I wouldn't call it a clash of camps. But clash of camps, okay. Less, okay. Uh, yeah. How would you call it? No, I mean, uh, uh, I think uh, the... Um, uh, how would I call it? There are, there are of course, always uh, different views. There are members of the governing council who are basically hired to make monetary policy. You do that in a collective, and obviously they don't always have the same views. Um, and it's not true, by the way, huh, that those views are always, um, let's say, enshrined in the uh, position of a jurisdiction of which a Governing council is uh, gov governing council members coming from. Uh, there are members of the governing council. Um, I mean, first of all, as a member of the governing council, you have to look at the your area position and not at the position of your 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 member state or or, or the country that that you are of which you are heading the central bank. Um, and th when you look at individual countries and you, when you look at the view of uh, some uh, governing council members. Those uh, they're not always preaching or not always saying what would be the optimal policy point of view from the point of view of their individual country. On top of this, uh, you also have six executive board members, uh, including the president and the vice president. Yeah, that with and that having having six with really a European hat on also prevents this uh, national okay. bias, however you want to call it, from uh, from happening. But they're still... Yeah, uh, different views, of yeah. course. Yeah. yeah. Isn't this inherent to the system? Yes, and I think that's good. Uh, because uh, somebody once said, uh, policy, monetary policy, it's not a science, it's an art. And it is an art. Um, so uh, then it's good to have the, 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 the steering wheel not in one hand, but in a group of people, the hands of a group of people in a collective. Normally when you drive a car, I wouldn't recommend this. But here I think it's, it, it is, I think, uh, the best system. Uh, because uh, there is no perfect foresight, there are a lot of uncertainties. I think COVID showed it, but there are so many, many developments over time, especially crisis periods. It's very difficult to predict what will happen with the economy. Uh, and um, you have to make an assessment over the medium term, how prices will develop. Uh, yeah, this is not something that, and of course you can use an, use an, a model, but every economist will tell you a model, it's an interesting tool and it will help you, uh, but it's not the truth. That's why it's called a model. Uh, and, uh, so it's good to, to, to have these different views around the table. At the same time, uh, we have well publicly heard uh, that classical is sometimes a bit upset with the positions or the decisions being made within the governing council. 
No, I mean, he did that once. Uh, then he clearly spoke out in public. Yeah. Um, uh, and he had, uh, he had good reasons to do so. Uh, but yeah, it, it's not uh, it's not something. If you are a member of the governing council, that you do every six weeks or so. Yeah? So when you do this, you really ha need to have a good reason for that. And uh, when you, of course, when you are sitting around the table, uh, uh, you know, you always try to seek at least that is the the the, the, the approach taken in the governing council. Uh, uh, to find consensus, which doesn't necessarily mean that everybody agrees or there is, there's, that there is unanimity, uh, but it, it means that those who actually do not agree are still able to agree in a way. Um, and, uh, and that is the way that is the way how it goes. So decisions can be taken by the governing council where you, where you are saying to yourself, okay, if I would have taken the decision on my own, it would have been a different one, but I accept here the... the yeah. The consensus view. Okay. If you're the single driver of the car, where would you we see like since the COVID pandemic, the bond buying is more fiscal policy, but is a tool is being used to steer the economy of the European Union. Uh, if you were the single driver of the car, what way would you push the yeah, new? Uh, it's even? a very it's a very hypothetical question because I'm not so. Uh, it's uh, uh, I'm not first of all I'm not a member of the governing council. I'm just the alternate. Klaus Knott is the member of the governing council and. We're not dr uh, driving the car. Uh, the driving. The but car would you see all. more of the fiscal uh, policy push that's been happening? Um, I think again at the European le at the Dutch level, I think that, that we really saw a good policy mix uh, at the European level. Uh, yeah, there. As I said, there are some complications here because not everybody has the same starting point as the Netherlands when it comes to public finance. But um, yeah, at the same time, there is the, the as I already mentioned, the next generation, uh, the, the EU fund that uh, that plays here. But overall, I mean, fiscal policy in the also in the euro area uh, last year and most likely also this year has been expansionary, given the nature of this crisis, given where we are in terms of the effect of lower bound. Uh, this is uh, most likely the appropriate policy mix that we are seeing at this point in time. So you, you would expect also to uh, use more in the future in similar situations. Well, let's not hope it happens anytime uh, soon. Uh, but uh, uh, you say it absolutely, absolutely right. It very much depends on the situation. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, went from the European level to now back to the Dutch National Bank. A part of your uh, portfolio is financial stability. Mm -hmm. um, what does it hold, and what does the Netherlands look like now? Is it financially stable? I think it's financially stable, but of course, it's also our job to always uh, pinpoint risks, uh, and that's that's what we are paid for. Uh, um, so even when things are actually going pretty well, you could say uh, we still we're still trying to find risks. So when we talk about financial stability, let me start by saying first that it's also our job to maintain what these contribute to financial stability. It's not purely in our hands. Uh, only, uh, but but uh, I would say we are uh, currently in such a state of financial stability, however you want to call it. But there are definitely risks that we that we see. True, such as um, there there are several. Uh, there is for the Netherlands typically, of course, there is the the real estate market, the the residential real estate market, uh, uh, with prices going up. Let's say really, really a lot. Uh, uh, we saw this month, I sh or should say the month of May, we saw an increase in prices of, uh, let's say again, double digit, uh, which is uh, which is really uh, uh, which is really a lot, um, and of course, uh, on the t on t it also means that people have to borrow more money, rel in relative terms, more money to to buy a house. And that makes them vulnerable. And now interest rates are low, but they may not be low forever. Um, that's, I think, one thing. The other thing is maybe it's it's uh, a financial stability risk that we see for, for a very long time already uh, is the risk of cyber. We see digitalization of, of the economy, a digitalization of the financial system, which, all mean, which, all, which is good, by the way, uh, but it also means that the financial system has become more vulnerable to, to uh, let's say, attacks, uh, uh, cyber attacks. So that risk has also uh, has also increased. Um, 
the, the, the low rate environment, the low interest rate environment that we currently have, uh, we also see signs that there, it leads to a certain surge for yield uh, because interest rates are so low. Yeah. Um, and there's also, so maybe people take more risk on board on their balance sheet uh, than they actually should, uh, given the low interest rates. Um, that's also uh, that's also I think a risk that we see in terms of financial in, in financial stability, and then of course uh, also something that we have been a lot of been doing a lot of work on uh, is uh, is climate change, uh, which also has a major impact on the economy. Uh, whatever whatever way it will go, uh, whether it will happen or not, or, or will be prevented, let's put it that way, by means of government policy policy. Uh, and therefore might also impact financial stability. Yeah, you're, you're pretty outspoken about um, greening or, or climate uh, change and that we need to do something about it. You've also called upon the government to mm -hmm. do more uh, recently in the NRC, I think it's a, a month ago or something. Um, where does this, this belief come from that you, you really want to put this out there and uh, talk about housing market, climate, and, and call upon the government? Yeah, I mean, I mean, cl climate change is one of the, um, as I said, it's one of the, uh, the, it's an event, also here again, an external event in the sense that it's not, uh, let's say, uh, inside our economic system, so to speak. Uh, you can debate about that. Of course, there is a linkage between CO2 emission and economic growth, but it's, it's, it's let's consider it uh, an external event. Uh, which is which might have actually or which will have a huge impact on economic development and hence also financial and financial stability. And there are two scenarios in a way. Yeah, um, and we are in a way. I mean, as a person, I I I want governments and the whole society to be effective in let's say reducing the impact of climate change or fighting it. But let's say as a central bank, we are agnostic. You could say, but there are two scenarios here. One scenario is that uh, climate change will, uh, will um, uh, really be quite bad, that average temperatures will increase a lot, um, that will have a huge impact on, on global economy. Uh, maybe it will be uh, uh, nice to live in the Netherlands, but many parts of the world will become inhabitable. There will be food short shortages, there will be flooding, there will be a lot of, uh, let's say, climate uh, refugees, immigrants, um, uh, that's one scenario um, that might happen. And uh, yeah, it's something you have to prepare for in a way. Uh, so if you are a bank or an insurance company or a pension fund, you have to think through whether you have managed that risk appropriately. The other side scenario is what we call the transit is what we call a scenario of transition risks. In that scenario, governments are actually very successful eh, in preventing climate change happening to the extent I just described. Uh, but they probably then also embark on policies like um, pricing CO2 emissions, so CO2 taxes. Uh, and that's also going to have an impact on the economy. And if you are a bank and if you are lending a lot of money to uh, companies that play a very important role at this point in time in the emission of CO2, yeah, you run a certain risk because the value of, the comp of that particular company might decline. Um, and uh, th so that's the second scenario where we say, okay, but you also have to prepare for that. The second scenario, of course, is in a longer term perspective, the best but it requires uh, transition from, the, from our, let's say, fossil fuel-based economy to more renewable or CO2 uh, uh, low uh, 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 energy sources and economy. And that will take time and that's going to be painful also. Uh, and um, yeah, the challenge will be is how you go through that period, how you manage the risks throughout that period. There are a lot of upfront costs in the second scenario. Yeah, yeah, true. But there are also costs in the first scenario, and they will be much higher, but there will be more at the end. Yeah, yeah. So what should we do now? Now, I think, and we, that's also something that we have said uh, a few times, I think uh, 
first and foremost, um, CO2 prices or CO2 emissions should be priced much more. Uh, CO2, the cost of CO2 emissions should be internalized uh, in our economic system. At the moment, that's not the case or only mm -hmm. partially the case. And one way of doing that, and you can read that in every, uh, let's say, uh, first year textbook of economics. Uh, one I think way it's even given in uh, high school now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tax, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is, uh, is indeed to introduce a carbon tax. Um, and that's, that's one of the most effective ways of, uh, of, let's say, changing the structure of the economy from high CO2 emission to low CO2 emission. There are many more things that need to happen, but from our point of view, this is extremely Which important. Which instance, on a Netherlands, like on a Netherlands system level or like on a grander one? Uh, we, no, I think when you start doing this, a carbon tax, uh, we don't think it's very wise to do that for the Netherlands alone. Uh, I mean, um, first of all, the impact will be relatively low. And secondly, the costs in terms of uh, an unlevel playing field, the costs will be quite high. So if you go for a carbon tax or a system that introduces uh, 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 more uh, CO2 pricings, like in the European Union, you have the ETS, uh, that is something indeed you should do at the international level or the European level. Um, of course, the Dutch government could also do things on its own. There are certain areas where we still subsidize certain sectors, industries, um, uh, for uh, with respect to to their energy use. Uh, the, the greenhouses is a very good example, but also uh, uh, one of the reasons why tickets of airplanes, uh, of, 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 of not tickets of airplanes, but tickets of flights are uh, relatively cheap, at least of some airlines, is that there's also still a subsidy or at least not a tax on these uh, fuels. Um, and those are things, of course, the Dutch gov gov government could do as well. So where you really deviate in an international context by your national policies, you can at least try to create a level playing field. But a really fully-fledged carbon tax, there we say, yeah, of course, we need to have it, but let's have it at the European level. Yeah. Um, today and yesterday, or over the last couple of days, actually, it was in the news that um, one of the big Dutch uh, pension funds, ABP, has a large stake in still in fossil fuels, so even though they promised to deviate from it. Um, that it, part of the DB's task is to supervise it. So what's your perspective on, on this information, this news? No, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, um, uh, it's not up to me here to comment on individual institutions, financial institutions that we supervise. And it's also not the case that we decide uh, exactly in which investment the pension fund should invest and which not. I mean, then we would be, then people should hire us as the board of trustees and we are not, we are the supervisor. So it's their responsibility to take these, or board of trustees' mm -hmm. responsibility to take these decisions. Uh, but, of course, we do challenge them uh, and uh, we do want, and that's true for pension funds, insurance companies and banks, we do want that financial institutions uh, take into account those risks, which is, I was just talking about, mm -hmm. uh, uh, climate change risks. And if we feel that they're not doing that appropriately, also depending on their exposures, et cetera, et cetera, um, yeah, then of course, the, then, then we can intervene, but that will not take the form of telling a pension fund uh, you should stop investing in this or you should invest in, in that. That's complicated. We did it a few times, but, but uh, not in the area of, of uh, 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 climate change. But the famous case when I was still res myself responsible for pension fund. Supervision was a case where a pension fund had invested a very large amount of the assets in gold, so basically in one asset. But I also know from that case that it's extremely, extremely difficult huh, yeah. uh, from a legal point of view to, to make these kind of uh, uh, interventions, but it would be a kind of more general intervention that we would say a particular pension fund needs to take certain steps to have its risk management, let's say, in order. Uh, so, how, so how do you manage risks of climate change? From 
I mean, we do not. Man I mean, we do manage them ourselves, but uh, when it comes to our own balance sheet, but but we we're not telling financial institutions how to do it. Uh, but uh, at least we are we are supervising and monitoring uh, uh, the way they do it. Uh, and uh, I totally acknowledge if people say, but it's complicated and there is not that much information out there. There are no standards, there are no norms. It's all true uh, mm -hmm. to measure it. But that's why two things. That's why we should work on this. There should be more information regarding uh, climate change risks affecting companies. Yes, we need to do more in terms of standardization um, of standards, but that's not a reason to say, but we're not going to do anything. Uh, so it doesn't take away that responsibility, we feel. Yeah. Okay. Can we uh, talk about housing markets? We, you mentioned it before. Um, because, well, I hope that one day I will be able to, to buy a house. Um, my uh, professors in economics told me I probably wouldn't, uh, which is kind of well, a sobering message. What do you think? Uh, I'm an optimist, uh, so I really hope for you that you will be able to buy a house. And I think um, what, we, what we also propose in a way would also make it possible that that would happen. And because we said, one of the things that we said is that um, now the reason why people buy a house or rent a house uh, is mainly driven by, by fiscal measures. Uh, and you want to take that away. Uh, and basically what we said is that having a house, owning a house, uh, it's like owning a specific kind of wealth. Mm -hmm. And then treat it like, from a fiscal point of view, or from a tax point of view, you, just, you, 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 you should just treat it as any other kind of wealth. And not uh, try to continue to stimulate um, the uh, purchases of uh, houses via uh, uh, deductibility of the mortgage interest or the interest rate on, on the mortgage yeah. that you pay. There was a time when this was very useful, but I think we don't need that time anymore. That's one of the things. Uh, secondly, of course, obviously, and a lot of people are saying that we need to build more houses, uh, and uh, but also need to take measures to develop uh, the private uh, the private renting market, and that's another problem. Uh, that there's also the supply of, uh, let's say, private rental apartments or rental houses is also very limited. And um, what a lot of cities are doing in the Netherlands at this point in time uh, is um, coming up with local legislation to avoid that investors buying up houses and then start renting those out, sometimes at very high prices. Um, I do have some sympathy for what the municipalities or local governments want to do and know why they're doing it. I totally mm -hmm. understand it, but it's not going to solve the problems in the housing market. Actually, it's going to make them worse uh, because then there is no, uh, if you yes, at a certain true. point uh, start to work somewhere or you and you start to, to, to earn a, re a reasonable income, you will not be applicable for social housing. Yeah. Uh, you are not able to buy that house because of uh, uh, the, the high prices. Uh, and your salary or your income is not high enough to get a mortgage. Uh, and if you don't have uh, parents or family members who can help you out, um, then, then you have a problem. But at the same time, you can also not go to the private rental market because there's not much supply. And where there is supply, the, ra the rents are extremely high. So that means that basically there are certain areas in the Netherlands where you cannot live anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that's that's a very bad situation. For the inns, it's very nice, of course, if you are living in a house which has increased in value a lot. Yeah. Um, but for the outs, it's it's yeah, it's something that uh, yeah, we should not have this dichotomy. Let's put it that way. Yeah, uh, in our society. You said you were an optimist, but this is a very very grim picture. You sketch like how do like so many problems? How do we escape this? Like, uh, it, it it requires political will. And I think the measures that can be taken, uh, 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 they're not impossible. You know, I'm not saying we should put somebody on Mars within a week. You know, these are measures. I mean, they take time, obviously. But from, from a legal point of view, from a fiscal point of view, uh, it's possible to embark, embark upon such a reform of the housing market. Uh, so build more, 
uh, stimulate uh, supply of uh, houses in the private rental market, as well as uh, treat uh, uh, houses from a tax point of view, just like any other uh, kind of wealth. You need to take time for that uh, because the peep the ends, so to speak. If you do that from one day to the other, they will uh, Riot. cry yeah. wolf. <laughs> Uh, so you have to do that uh, gradually, but already, you know, having such a plan in place, uh, and this will take years, eh? but having Culture, such a plan in place will, will already, years. yeah, maybe five to ten years, will already make a huge difference. But and now uh, the ins are so strong, in a way, yeah. uh, that they're, they're, most political parties do not dare to touch this, because, yeah, uh, the ins say, no, it's not going to happen. Yeah, there's a subsidy for, for having houses, and you should, it should be a shift to taxing yeah. it as an asset. Yeah, and, and, and uh, yeah, but yes, yes, yeah, that's a very good way to summarize what I said. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> but it's, it's, it seems like a very stark change. Yeah, but it's possible, why not? And let's also, first of all, we are not the only ones who say this. A lot of institutions say this, yeah. recently the IMF, the OECD. And it's a system that we have in a, a lot of countries around us. I mean, we are. I mean, we are. Uh, we are the odd ones, not the other ones. Eh? Mm. Uh, and again, there were very good reasons to have a system in place, you know, to facilitate uh, own occupied housing um, when this whole system was developed. But uh, I don't think that is that necessary anymore. On top of it, doing something about it now, the transition costs might actually be relatively low because the interest rates are so low. Mm. Uh, and you, we already see that happening. Uh, that, that, so you get a kind of perverse situation that um, uh, for, uh, we have introduced a couple of years ago the, the, the rule or the law in the Netherlands that you can only um, deduct the uh, interest rate payments on your mortgage from, yeah. your, from, your, uh, from your taxable income when uh, you redeem the mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, and when you have an interest-only mortgage, which was very popular uh, during a certain period of time, you're not able to make use of that fiscal facility. Now, what we see actually is that, in particular, a lot of young people, uh, uh, because when they take an interest-only mortgage, they can borrow more money to buy that very expensive house. And they say, and they realize, of course, they cannot use the tax facilities, yeah. but they say, we don't care because the interest rate is so low. You know, yeah. it, it'll cost us maybe, I don't know, uh, uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 euros more a month, but at least we are able to afford that house. That may be good news in the short run, but it's an interest-only mortgage. So you're not paying back the mortgage. And so sensing that this so is, the, uh, the risks risk. are building up for yeah. that group. So it's 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 it's... You're doing the wrong thing. Paradoxically, the, the, from a medium-term uh, point of view, we are allowing, uh, um, yeah, uh, we are allowing risks to build up instead of decreasing them. This is a financial stability risk. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Can we expect a financial uh, housing bubble? Sorry, a housing bubble. Uh, that, I, that, I, that I don't know. We don't foresee really a, pri a, a big decline in prices in our uh, projections for the Dutch economy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we foresee a, a rise this year of 10%, but then it will gradually go down a little bit because there's, all, there's the so shortage of supply. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, but um, having said that, I simply don't know. And you might see corrections in certain markets and there might be certain circumstances, I mean, if interest rates would go up quickly, for whatever reason, yeah, it will definitely have an impact on, on house prices. Okay. Uh, but but uh, if you, if you uh, at least in the context of our production, pr projections, we, we do see a leveling off of the, of the, of the growth of prices of houses, but um, yeah, I wouldn't call it, uh, let's say, an, an implosion of the housing market, no. And can we expect that with regards to the financial markets? Um, here again, I think there are there are there's the surge of yield eh, I've been mm -hmm. talking about. Yeah. At the other point in time, I mean, how do you value uh, the, the 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 an equity? Uh, you use a uh, a discounted cash flow model, uh, and a very important factor in a discounted cash flow model is the interest rate. Yeah. So if the interest rate is going down and is very low, yeah, it increases the value of the equity. So from an economic point of view, 
Uh, it's very well explainable what is happening. So that's the primary reason why I get all those notifications to my phone. Stock market reaches new high, and yeah, I mean, I mean, while, uh, everyone, while all the stores are closed because of COVID. Yeah, I mean, I mean. Uh, uh, so there are two factors here here uh, playing in different directions, um, and uh, but yes, I think one should be, especially when you are an individual investor. Yeah, you should always you should not let yourself uh, pull get pulled away by by uh, yeah constant rises in equity prices or even worse. Uh, uh, a Bitcoin that goes up uh, a lot and this kind of stuff. Uh, so it's always good to be wary of these kind of developments and that the basic rule that you should spread your investments and uh, especially when it comes to the Bitcoin, what goes up can also go down or mm -hmm. most likely will go down. Yeah. Yeah, that's always something that you have to take into account. Huh? That was part of the risks you mentioned with financial stability, the digitalization risk. Uh, the new surge of individual investors with the Giro, Bunk, uh, would you also count it as a risk or would you be... No, not necessarily. I think there's, there's, uh, I think it's important that we have this kind of innovation. Because uh, in the past, for an individual consumer, it was impossible to buy stocks unless you had a lot, a lot of money uh, or you were willing to accept very high transaction costs. Mm. So the fact that people can uh, be more active in a way on capital markets, I think is some, it's not bad. But there's a side effect to that, that you should manage as well. And so uh, I think one of the challenges of central banks, but also supervisors in general, is how do you find the balance between innovation on the one hand and uh, trust in the financial sector, um, uh, gamification of the apps. Security uh, in what's happening on the other hand. Uh, uh, but I, I would be, you should be careful in taking measures that really would stop innovation. Yeah. I don't think that's the way one should <clears throat> go. But at the same time, you should know what the risks are of, uh, of a lot of these developments. And then if necessary, also regulator, regulator or legislator act to it. But that's forbidding certain things it has always been a difficult game. Well, uh, I was not talking about forbidding because then I will lose my portfolio as well. Um, yeah, yeah, but you should be clear. You should be clear what happens, you know. Yeah. And and uh, there should be, I mean, if you do this kind of stuff, uh, fine. But you should also be clear that it can go uh, against you and that yeah. you may lose your money. And I think that's that's very important to always realize that. Yeah. Thank you. We've discussed a lot of uh, topics. I think so too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> From from European market economies uh, to the European Governing Council, uh, Dutch DNB, housing market, financial markets, financial stability, inflation. Um, hopefully, I can buy a house. Uh, it takes a I lot hope of political so will. I hope so too. Yeah. For you. Do you have a final message for people of our generation? A final message. Wow, that's uh, that's. Uh, no, I think what what um, coming back to COVID, I think the the. Your generation, uh, generation of students, I think, uh, or high school, is hit, uh, I think, particularly hard by COVID. Um, and uh, I mean, first of all, due to uh, let's let's call it the the difficulties of being educated last year. Um, and you know, I've also been involved in it myself as a as a as a professor. It's no fun, but it's no fun to teach. But also, if you are on the other side, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think it's horrible uh, if you constantly have to listen to, uh, to online uh, uh, lessons. Um, and I definitely hope that this year will not have, let's say, a more structural impact uh, on that group of students. Uh, I think the uncertainty for the younger generation has increased anyway. I have already mentioned climate change. Uh, and what it might do to the world if we are not able to, let's say, take measures to mitigate uh, this. Uh, most likely, I will be already be dead. But let's say yeah, the, the the younger generations, they are the ones who have to face this very grim scenario we are talking about. Um, um, and um, uh, yeah, so so it's it's not easy, and I, I always also talking to students sometimes and I thought 
come on guys you know yeah uh, and then you always look you you always do i mean what my parents used to do you look back at when you were, were young yourself uh, and um and we're thinking you know uh oh my god they're so spoiled uh, but then if you <laughs> if you listen to to also my students and and also uh relatives and friends and family and they say yeah but you know I just started university and I've been now one year university student. I haven't seen the building from inside. Uh, and I'm only 18 or 19 or 20 once. And I thought, yeah, you guys are totally right. Because indeed, when I place myself back in your shoes, yeah, it, 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 it works like that, you know? And so I think, um, especially your generation, the younger generation is hit most by COVID. And I think it's good to say because I'm not always sure whether everybody realizes that. Um, and uh, when it comes to, uh, let's say, um, policies or post-COVID recovery plans or, or however you want to, to, to call it, eh, we, we have said there's no need for more budgetary stimulation. We are already doing a lot. Uh, but in particular, um, looking at what has happened or what what are what is the scarring in this group, uh, this age group, I think, yeah, that that would be worthwhile. And and, and that's I mean, it's not so much a message towards you, you guys and and your peers, but it's more a message towards society. We realize that this is the group that's affected most by this pandemic. Even ally in the yeah. central bank. <laughs> yeah. That's good to know. Thank you very much for uh, this interview today. Thank you. My pleasure.